They stopped the music, so I guess that kind of means that <laughs> I can start. Great. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks very much for coming. At the end of the day, I, I do realize I am in the graveyard shift. Um, it's quite a full-on talk, too, so uh, hopefully uh, you're not all too completely drained by the experience of today, um, and you'll have some energy left for me. Uh, out of the party. You get a, afterwards, you get a beer, right? You get a victory beer for having made it through uh, all these sessions. Uh, my name's uh, Ian Cooper. You can find my, me on Twitter as iCooper. And I'm uh, going to talk today uh, mainly about a paper written by a guy called Pat Helen called Data on the Inside versus Data on the Outside. Um, but I'm going to call the talk Event Driven Collaboration because that's really the context in which I want to talk about that paper, and specifically about solving what I see are some problems that we kind of see people encountering when they move to a microservices-based approach, and they decide as part of that um, decision-making process that they think, oh, well, we would like to drive things with it by events, and then don't really know how. Um, and we'll explain what the problem is, and then we'll explain what your solutions are. Who am I? Um, this just says I'm old, this slide. But the bit I really care about is the bit on the bottom. And actually, I mean, Jerry Miller's around some. I don't know if he's actually in this talk today. But um, a quote I got from him, but I think he said it comes from somebody else, which is, there are no smart guys, just us. It's very easy for you guys to believe that because I'm elevated by about two feet that I'm somehow better than you. And that's really not true. I'm lucky enough to have had a range of career opportunities, which mean I have the experience that I can talk about, but I can guarantee to you that I'm no smarter than anybody else in this room. I, my only, my best characteristic is I'm dogged, but I'm certainly not, I'm not a genius. So if I can get this stuff, I promise you, you can. Um, I work on an open source library called Brighter, and we compete with things like Mass Transit and End Service Bus, and the Mediator. We provide a, um, command handler uh, framework that acts as a command processor, which means you can put things in the pipeline, but like Mediator does. And we act as a dispatcher in the same way between a command and a handler. But we also do uh, inter-process communication by way of messaging. And we support a number of transports, uh, RabbitMQ, SQS and SNS, Redis. Um, we have kind of beta support ready for things like Azure and Kafka. And we say beta-ish because no one on the team is currently using those in production, so we don't feel comfortable uh, saying you could just take it out of the box and do that. We would like someone to come along and say, I do use it in production and fix it. It'd be great. We are friendly towards new contributors. We have help-wanted issues. We took part in the .NET Foundation's Hackfest in the summer. We really would like you to come and participate. So if you've ever wanted to get an open source project, I promise we'll be nice to you. Um, we're not, you know, Linus Torvalds or anyone like that. Um, I'll be at PubConf tomorrow. There's a discount code on that. I think I tweeted it, so you don't have to try and copy it down. So if you haven't got a ticket, you can now get a discounted ticket for the after show party, um, which is lots of fun. OK, what are we going to talk about? Uh, we're going to talk about this notion of data on the inside versus data on the outside, this idea that Pat Holland, who's an architect, He's been working at places like uh, Microsoft, Amazon. I think he's now at Salesforce. And he's been dealing with scale most of his life. He was the guy that one of the people behind MS, distributed transactions controller, and later essentially recanted on his work on distributed transactions, saying that was a bad idea. Uh, here are better ideas. We'll talk about requests versus events. And by that, I really mean request-driven architectures versus event-driven architecture. So request-driven architecture is really one where every service you have calls other services you have via, say, HTTP or gRPC, as opposed to an event-driven architecture where your service listens for events from other services. We will then talk about a couple of important issues in that context. Reference data, which is really how the data versus the, on the outside versus the inside fits in to this notion of event-driven architectures. And we will talk about correctness. Correctness becomes an issue for you when you start using this uh, uh, approach. What, what we mean by that is if two services share 
the notion of some data, how do you know that they both have the same concept of that data? And finally, we'll wrap up a little bit with a couple of things that are slightly tangential to the main topic. Uh, composition, where you can do composition and, uh, of services and effectively uh, conversations between services. And we only really mention them because they, they can sometimes bleed over into the topics we're talking about. Okay. There's actually going to be no code in this. Originally, when I wrote the proposal for this talk, like six months ago, I, I, I thought I was going to write some, show you some code. The problem has become that as I've got, worked my way through the slide deck, I've kind of reached the point where I've run out of time on just explaining how this stuff works and there wouldn't be enough time to show you code. So my promise to you is I will get some code up and I will tweet about it so you can see an example of how this works that's simple enough to grok. But it's just not going to be possible to have done that in this session in the time available. I need really 90 minutes probably to cover it if I put code in. Okay. Um, so if that's a deal breaker for you, .NET Rocks crew next door, I won't take it personally, but I just want that to be clear. So I think lots of feedback saying, but there was no code. Um, uh, the other thing to note is, for the first time, every, every time I come here, you always say the, talk, the content's great in, but your slides are really text heavy. So, so influenced by young Jessica, stand up, Jessica, because it's all your fault. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've drawn my slides, uh, which has been a learning curve. Um, you can tell me afterwards, in person over a beer, whether you think that helped. The advantage of drawing over trying to do like you know PowerPoint art and stuff is you can get kind of what you want but I'm not a great artist. One or two things will happen. We'll all decide that Ian's drawings communicate very well, even though they're not beautiful, and it will be a triumph for the drawing on slides. Or we'll decide that people like Ian who can't draw shouldn't do hand-drawn slides. <laughs> it will be an experiment for all of us to take part in. Um, many of my examples involve shipping. I worry about that because I've never worked in shipping in my entire life, but it seemed like an easy one to pick. Fortunately, I've discovered that according to our government, not knowing anything about shipping is no obstacle to receiving large amounts of money for shipping. So I feel like I'm like a good company. And if Seaborn is looking for an application for their, their shipping service, I feel quite content that I would be able to provide it. That's a Brexit joke for the people who are not UK based. <laughs> OK. So about data on the inside, that's a data on the outside. Microservices. Who, who's building something here which kind of they would call microservices? Who, who's got a monolith that someone's told them they have to turn into a microservice? Who, who has a monolith and damn you, Ian, I'm not changing it? <laughs> Yay! So there are good reasons to still have monoliths in some places. Okay. So when I, one of the things to understand about microservices is that there's kind of a family history. There's a guy called Jim Weber. Anyone know who Jim Weber is? He used to work for ThoughtWorks. And uh, Jim came up with an idea called Gorilla SOA. So back in the day, what we called service-oriented architectures was the way we used to split up uh, our, our, our landscape and enterprises into a number of indep independent services that all represent what we call business capabilities. A business capability is um, in a company, you have departments, and those departments can do things. So marketing, for example, can do a thing called lead generation. They fill a pipeline full of potential sales for the sales team. That lead generation is a capability, right? People who, uh, in other parts of the organization, know there's a marketing department, would expect that marketing department to be able to do lead generation for them. Business capabilities were seen as the ideal target for services. So we created services around all these capabilities and then plugged them all together. And the way traditionally they got plugged together was a thing called um, uh, an um, event bus. And the thing about these event buses were they were how vendors got their sticky paws into the world of SOA, right? You need to have one of these in order basically to be doing SOA properly. So BizTalk is a kind of classic example of these some of you guys may be aware of. And the trouble with them was that they're centralized. You can't really test them because you know, it's just whole loads of uh, point and click workflow that you're using inside. And essentially their goal was to say, well, if you have all these point to point connections, you'll have spaghetti. But all they really did was just sweep the spaghetti under the carpet and hide it 
and pretend that everything now looked nice and clean. And as a result, SOA started to get a bad name because it became kind of dependent on these event buses in the center. So Jim said, uh, the other thing was, well, that used to happen was he got really hard because somebody central controlled it. So he wanted to do something, he quite often had to fill out forms in triplicate and send them off and get this you know, change control board to agree that your, your service can now participate in the company uh, event, service, event bus. And so Jim said, well, let's not do that. Let's just, most people actually only have a small number of services. They can just talk to each other point to point. Just use uh, REST, because he's a big, big REST guy, effectively to talk between two services, or just like a lightweight uh, broker like RabbitMQ. This suddenly became quite popular. Now, Jim worked with a guy called Fred George. Anyone know Fred George? So Fred George came up with this idea called Programmer Anarchy. And Programmer Anarchy was, Programmers are the most important thing in any organization. So you probably like inside of Program Anarchy right now. And he said, the first thing we do in Program Anarchy is we fire all the product managers. You may like the idea even more now. Second thing we do is fire all the QAs. And then developers just work with the customers on building services. But then he said, I want to turn the dials up to 11, which is a Spinal Tap reference, which I'm not sure everyone gets anymore. Um, I want to turn the dials up to 11 uh, on uh, Microsoft, on, on, on the way we do Agile and the SOA. And he said, I've been working with this guy, Jim, and Jim Weber has told me that basically 100,000 lines of Java on a monolith is bad, but 10,000 lines is good. If 10,000 lines is good, why is not 1,000 lines better? And why is not 100 lines even better? So his notion was this idea said, well, it's a bit like the body. You've got all these cells, and the cells constantly replenish themselves. So if I have a 100-line service, then I can just rewrite it every six months when I figure out a better way of doing it. And he called that idea microservices. And that's where this notion of microservices are about lines of code, et cetera, comes from. People looked at that, and rightly, because that's where Fred had meant to pitch it, that was seen as kind of like extreme, extreme version of, of practice. And then on came Martin Fowler, because nothing exists until Martin names it. And Martin Fowler and James Lewis created a basic definition of microservices, but it was much more based on Jim Weber's Gorilla SOA. Right. So that's kind of the history of that idea. And that's why you see conflict out there is, what is a microservice? And the answer is there are two versions of what is a microservice. But all of them derive from SOA, one just an extreme one. Okay. So SOA had four essential tenets for describing a service. Okay. Services are autonomous. Boundaries are explicit. Share schema, not type. Compatibility is based on policy. <coughs> what do we mean? Okay. Compatibility is based on policy. We can kind of move away from a little bit. It just said we should use standards to figure out how two services can interoperate. Okay. Boundaries are explicit. Boundaries are explicit says the service is kind of like an event horizon. People outside are not allowed to look in. They can't see my internals. They don't know what the schema of my database is. They don't know how my code operates. All they can talk to is an API at the perimeter. And by an API, we could mean something like an HTTP plus JSON service or gRPC, but we might mean an event being raised. Okay? So this generic notion of some kind of API. That's the only thing you can see as an outsider and touch. You're never allowed to peer inside. It's like an object, but on a macro scale, right? We're doing information hiding. Now, the advantage of that is the team that owns the service can change it as much as they want, and provided they maintain that external contract, nobody downstream cares. Okay? Coupled to that, our services are autonomous. This team should now be able to deploy that service independently. Provided they maintain that contract, that API boundary stable, if they want to do 400 releases a day, that is entirely up to them. Nobody downstream should go, be able to go, hang on a minute, you can't do that. I've got to change my, right? They shouldn't have. And for that reason, the database is nearly is always inside that service. You do not share databases in a microservice environment. And finally, compatibility, share schema not type, rather. Share schema not type means don't give the other service a .NET assembly and say, okay, 
that's the types you use to basically send me messages or to listen to my, uh, talk to my HTTP endpoint. If I share types with you, one of the things I've done is say, well, if I change my API, I have to reissue everybody types. But I've also limited what languages you can implement in. Right? Sharing a .NET assembly is no use to somebody who's writing their service in Go, who may be actually also part of your organization. So you need to share an independent format. So you share something like, I prefer plain text, so JSON or XML. Um, I'm old enough to think XML is actually a good idea, like comments rather than JSON. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing you can do is things like protobuf. Uh, I'd avoid Avro like the plague, but we'll explain that later why. Um, but plain text is tend to be better than uh, binary formats uh, because anything can read plain text. So only go to binary formats if you know that for performance reasons you need to. Plain text is every language is going to be able to read plain text somehow. Okay. So the key idea I need you to understand from this slide is that my service has a kind of event horizon around it and it owns its data and its code. And nobody can peer inside. They can only peer on the outside edge. Okay. So data that lives inside my service, and we can think of it as the system of record for some entities that it owns, can be updated by the service. I can create new instances, I can update instances, or I can read them. Right? So if this is my registry of ships, Obviously, I don't have many ships if I'm seaborne. Um, but if it's a registry of ships, I can effectively add new ones. I can update them, update the registry numbers and their, their names. right? And effectively, um, I can even delete them if I wanted to. I'm not showing that here. But I can get rid of ships. right? Externally, I still give you information about ships when you request it. If I didn't give you any information, I wouldn't be a microservice. I'd be a standalone application. So I must be sharing with you somehow, right? So my API, you maybe you make a get to me on a, on a REST endpoint, and I give you some information about ships. Can I have some ship information? Yeah, absolutely, here. Can you tell me what the Lady Gislaine is, right? It's a yacht. Um, by Robert Maxwell. Um, can you tell me, basically, can you, I want to know when, when ships' names change. Can I listen for an event? Okay. The key thing about those events is that they're read-only. Okay. They are a read-only snapshot of a portion of my data that I'm sharing. There's no point in you changing it because you are not the system of record. The system of record is the database living inside the service, and that is wholly clothed within the event horizon of my service boundary. You cannot touch it. So that is immutable data. Okay. So Pat Helen called these two types of data, data on the inside and data on the outside. Data on the inside belongs to the single writer and is only useful within the context of the service. Data on the outside is what we share between the services. And much of the rest of the talk is really focused more on data on the outside rather than data on the inside and what it's like and what we can do with it. OK. This is after my scanner broke. Uh, OK, right. So the important thing to understand is that inside data is mutable. That's where we change stuff. And that means I, as the service, am the sole owner of that data. I'm the authority, and you must talk to me. That gives me, the, serv the owners of that particular service, the team writing the code, the power to decide what are the business rules that get applied to this service. Right? I can contain them here, and I can control them. Data on the outside is immutable. We don't, right? There's nothing you can do to that data effectively. You just need to essentially read it and deal with it. Data on the outside becomes stale as soon as it is published. Once I've published that piece of data, because it's immutable and lives outside, it always risks that something else will ask my service to update the data, because it can be asked to update data. Right? It can be asked to make a change to the data that it controls that's mutable, and that data has now moved ahead in time. The message that I published, or the results of the get that you did before that happened, are now stale. Physics. Okay. 
So we have to deal with this problem of that data. So the key thing we want to do to that data is to version it. By versioning the data, we can always figure out, and it could be a timestamp as well as an incrementing version number, but some form of, or an e-tag, but some form of versioning so that we can say, do we have the current version of the data? Or are we stale? Most of us are probably web devs. Who's a, who's a web dev or deals with basically a REST API or, okay, so all of you kind of deal, have dealt with a REST API, something like that, okay. Most of us deal with this all the time. If I get some data, then quite often the headers on that data will indicate things to me about that data and my ability to store it locally in a cache. So they'll say to me, oh, it's got a max age of 30, right? After 30 seconds, this data may well be stale. Please check to see whether or not this data is valid anymore. I don't necessarily have to get new data. I can ask the server and say, hey, the last time I saw this data was, I don't know, uh, 15th of Jan 2018, right? Do you have a new copy? And the server can respond and say, three or four not modified. No, you have the current copy of the data. Or it can respond by giving me fresh data. Ah, you're out of date. Here's the new version. So we're dealing with this notion of saying we are asking a system for data. It's outside data, because once it's, it's left the service boundary and come to us, and it is immutable, and it is versioned. And we use this all the time to improve the performance of our applications by allowing us to trade latency for availability at the cost of consistency. So we say, I want a low latency call to nearby data, which I know will be available, even if the origin server is offline, and I accept as the price of that that my data is not necessarily consistent because it may have changed on the origin server <coughs> since I asked for it. And this we can think of, begin to think of as an idea called reference data. It's data on the outside of our application that we can cache so that you can use it locally. All right. We can think about some of our data in terms of operators and operands. Right. So the operator is some notion of what is this data in response to a kind of piece of behavior. Now that's easier with something like a command, where effectively maybe I'm sending you a message, which is a command which says something like new ship um, or re register new ship, and I might give you some data to say, here's the ship name, here's its registry number, whatever you do for ships, I'm not really sure. Okay. And that data is future state. Because I haven't written it to the database yet, and therefore it's a potential state of the data, because something might go wrong and it doesn't get written, right? So this is a hoped for state of the data, that's future state, and that's future state operand data. So here I think, well, yeah, we're doing a put where we're saying, hey, you know, um, presumably I, I thought, change the name of this ship. It's future state data, I'm saying. Go ahead and change this, the name of the ship. And the put is the operator, and the operand is basically the body of the HTTP request. And over on the other side, I've published an event out of the system. So it's past state. Okay. And the operator really is that a ship name was updated, and the operand is the data that basically was updated in that process. All right. um, as a kind of aside, it's important when we think about data on the outside, as well as thinking just about versioning to think about things that just like item potence and deduplication. So item potence becomes important because from the outside when I'm sending you future state data, there's no real guarantee that you might not have seen the message before. And when I receive messages from outside, there's no guarantee I might not have received it already. Here's the reason why. When my, let's just, my ship registry talks, for example, to my ship broker service, I send you a message, 
and I wait for an acknowledgement to see you've got that message. Right? But I don't know if I don't receive an acknowledgement whether you didn't get the message or I just didn't get the reply. Unfortunately, the world is uncertain and there's really no way for us to tell which one of those two scenarios happened. So it's quite likely that in order to show reliability, I as the sender will say, if I didn't get an acknowledgement, I'll send it to you again. And that means that the receiver tends to need to either say, I'm going to deduplicate. In other words, if I have seen this before, I will throw it away. Or be item potent. In other words, I can just keep reapplying this operation forever and it won't make any difference. I mean, you can do some tricks, for example, on the liner, for example. If I'm versioning that number in the, of the line record internally, I can say, you know, what, what version are you sending me? You're sending me version 3. Well, I've already got version 4, so I'm going to discard the send that you're sending me. Okay. And looking when I receive messages, I can say, oh, well, this is version 8. I've already seen version 9. Your stuff's out of date. I'm going to reject it. Or you can look at the message ID and say, hey, I've seen this message. It's fine. I can ignore it. Or you can put the data, basically, and you can add a little message ID on the put and say, hey, here's this unique idea of this put. Have you seen it? So you can reject stuff you've already seen. Okay. Right. Keep that in your heads. Put that in the stack. Let's talk a little bit about request versus event architectures. So here's a classic model of a request architecture based on my entirely invented idea about how you ship cargoes. So imagine I have some service that essentially where I register ships. And you actually work in shipping. Um, uh, here's, my, here's a ship registry where effectively you, know, you register your ships. And here over there is a cargo charter where I register new charters, people who want to ship cargoes, and I register new cargoes. And in the middle is my service that says, assign cargoes to ships to go to some wonderful destination around the world. Right. Now, let's say I add a new cargo that I want to basically get shipped to a new location. In this kind of model of architecture, it's not driving anything. Okay. It's possible that I, I get some kind of call, but mostly it's probably quite likely I have an actor driving the kind of broker application who says, my job is essentially to, when new cargoes come in, to assign them to kind of ships or kick off that process. When I do that, what I do as the ship broker is I say, well, which ships are registered that have available cargo hold going to the destination? And what cargoes do I have? What are they containers? Are they dry bulk? Are they liquid? Does that fit on the ship? How much does it cost? Etc. And I match the two up. And I, I'm done, right? And I basically invoice the customer and say, and pay the shipper and take my profit in between. But the thing is, when people write this kind of architecture, usually when they're in the ship broker doing that work, they say, oh, I'm going to need a list of ships and destinations for those ships. So my service is going to call the other service to get that data. Or we need a list of cargoes that the customer wants to send. I better get that data. Oh, I need the list of the payment details of the customer so I can charge them. I better go and get that data. Okay. This is what we call a, requ a request-oriented architecture. In response to something happening, your service asks other services for information or data. There's a problem. Well, there are two problems. But with the, with the, the, the main one is temporal coupling. So temporal coupling says all of these services have to be running at the same time and up to work. Because I want to call the ship registry and the cargo charter, the ship broker requires them to be working in order to service requests. So the SLA of my ship broker can never be greater than the SLA of my ship registry and my cargo charter. And because of the way these numbers work, they actually need to be much higher to support. If I want four nines, they're going to have to be higher than four nines because there's two of them. And if I just want to release a new version of my ship registry, I've got to negotiate with the ship broker people because, you know, or I've got to release parts of it around, do some complicated schema to do that because I don't want to 
you know, screw up those guys and take in their, their shipbroken requests. That's what makes the money. I also, to some extent, do what we call behavioral coupling, which means I, I know there's a ship registry service, and I know it's got an API, and I know it's got this format, and if they change that, I break. So, although it works, it's not really that robust. And one of the reasons people end up in this model is because they take their monolith, and they take a slice of their monolith, because then that's how you do it, and they take that out and make it a microservice. And then they say, hang on a minute, my microservice that's this stack in my business made these method calls outside of that particular boundary to other parts of my monolith, which are now also other services. So I've got a method call going between them. Wow, but I can't make a method call that's between two processes. Yeah, but on the other hand, RPC is just like a method call. So I can do HTTP plus JSON or gRPC between the two services, and it all works, right? And it does work. But whereas I had an in-process call that was highly reliable, I now have an out-of-process call that's, highly, that's not reliable at all. Because the network's not reliable, it's like to partition. And so essentially, I've now reduced the availability of my overall system by making it microservices. And I may have reduced my ability to deploy because I've got dependencies between these services. One thing you need to know before we get to the next slide is we can talk about three types of messages. Commands, that's an instruction to do something. Events, which are an indication that something happened. And a document, which is an information that something happened with some information on top of it. Uh, the classic example I use is a command is make me a cup of tea. It's an instruction given to one person. I am thirsty and could really do with a cup of tea is an event. One of you might get up and service the request for me, but I have no, no, no way of knowing that would happen. And a document message is, I am really thirsty and could do with a cup of tea. Uh, it's white, no sugar. I'm giving you information which helps you process that request. Okay. So what I could do is describe, I know this diagram is confusing, we're going to walk through it. It's create some kind of mixed architecture. So over here, I could say, well, I know what I'm going to do. When I get to the point of having basically a new cargo added, I will raise an event to say, new cargo added. And my ship broker service can begin, can use that to initiate a process of matching my cargo up with another ship, and effectively its cargo capacity and its voyage destination. But I've still not solved the problem that in order to do that, it's going to have to get some charter details. I might have given some information in, the, in the, the new cargo, but I probably need to find out who the charterer is and who pays for stuff. And um, I also need to go and get a list of ships. How am I going to work around that? Well, the guys writing the get charter details say, ah, we're just going to use GRPC like we always did. But the guys talking to ship register, they say, hang on a minute, why don't we use messaging? I can do kind of a request response. I can send a command message saying, give me the list of ships. And I can send a private channel with that to call me back on. And they can basically call me back on the private channel, and they can say, here's the list of ships. I've done messaging. Surely that's better. Now I'm event driven. Look, we've got multiple events. It's all good. But the thing about request response is it's still effectively a request driven architecture. I may be using messaging. I may have RabbitMQ in there. But I'm still doing a request based architecture. Because there's only so long that I'm going to block waiting in my ship broker for the ship registry to respond. Yes, I am probably going to survive temporary network partitions much better because the ship registry will probably stutter you know, for, for a few seconds and then come back and read the next thing from the queue and give a response back. So I probably am more likely to hit my SLA, but it's still a request response. At some point, it, it has to basically say, I'm going to give up. Okay, and I'm still making a network call, which is increasing my cost and my latency. What I really want is just to add a new cargo and for the whole thing to work, such that the service in the middle, the, which aligns basically ships and their cargoes, doesn't have to talk to anybody else to get its job done. The horrible thing is my monolith used to do that. So this microservice is what is rubbish, right? Unless I can figure out some way to make that work. So we discussed earlier this idea 
the data on the outside, if it's versioned and immutable, is highly cacheable. The data that leaves my origin ship registry service, for example, I go and do a HTTP GET, and I say, give me this ship, or I listen for events, and you say, here's a ship, here's an update to the ship, that ship's gone. I could use that information by caching it to build a representation that I need of your data. This is not really that revolutionary, right? Your browser does this. When you go to the Brexit website you know, at the BBC to figure out you know, what insanity our government has perpetrated today, quite often in an enterprise, you have a forward proxy. And that means your browser just goes to the forward proxy and gets the BBC's website, because why make all that traffic across the internet for four people at lunchtime are all doing the same thing? If we can find out the BBC from the BBC that the page hasn't changed much, then we just get the, give you the latest version, right? Straight off the forward proxy. And your browser does the same thing. Your browser holds a copy of the page, and it says, this page hasn't changed since the last time you look at it. You know, we, we still haven't solved this problem. So given my have da whoops, data with an identity and a version, it is very cacheable. The version, because I know how stale it is. The identity, obviously, so I can match up one piece of data with another, right? And say, I've got this data. It's the same as your data. Is it the same version? I can discard duplicates, and I can figure out whether the data I've got is correct. So I have highly cacheable data, and I can make a copy of your data. And if I have a copy of your data, I can use that to process requests. If I have a copy of the ship registry information, I don't need to call you to get the ship registry information. I just process it using the version I have locally. So I can move away from a request-driven architecture to an architecture where, I, where that service can, can deal with requests, it, it, events, and request itself without calling anybody else. Just use the local cache it has of the state that it required in order to process it. So Batman talks about three main types of reference data we need to deal with. Operand data. Operand data is essentially things that are arguments uh, that you need to understand about messages I send you or changes you want me to make. Okay? So the classic example would be a product catalog. Everybody needs a copy of the product catalog, so we can all talk about product IDs and names, etc. Um, historic data or snapshots is one that's less useful to us in this scenario, but that's really more about the idea of, I want to report on the data, but it's distributed across 20 microservices databases now. How do I do centralized reporting across about our enterprise? And the answer is you take a snapshot and you put that, collect those together in your analytical processing store and then you can process your reports against that piece of data instead. And shared collection data is where we have data that tends to be what everyone needs in order to get work done. So the really classic example is users. Your system has users. Lots of your services need to be able to say, OK, I want to put the user's name on the response I give you back in REST to say, for example, this person edited this record, this, this record at 7.15. I don't want to have to make a call to the user service with an ID number just to find out their name. I can just add that information out of my local cache. So users or customers are very common pieces of data to share. The theory says we can share it by any mechanism that is effective. So a lot of this depends on how frequently the data that we're sharing changes. It doesn't change very frequently at all. I, maybe I'm just FTPing a file down from the server, like a CSV file, and loading that in. Or I'm doing an extract of transform and load out of one database and just loading that in overnight to another one, to a cache. If it changes more frequently, I may well be making a call to you, gRPC or an atom fee, which we'll explain in a minute. Or maybe I'm listening for events. <coughs> Excuse me. What you're looking for is an appropriate solution to the problem, depending on the frequency at which it updates 
And the risk what you want to avoid is having downstream systems exposed to the internal schema representations of upstream systems. So if you want to use something like ETL, you need a view in your database so that you can essentially make sure that the extract that you expose comes off the view, which you can maintain consistently even if you change some of the schema internally for your own reasons. So one model to do this is um, called an active service. Now, I'm going to give you Fowler's name for something else in a second, but I think he really includes this. But this always, has always been traditionally known as an active service. So we'll stick that name for now. So an active service, my service, has, rather than just being woken up by, request, by an actor wanting to do something, it spins around. And every so often, it says, I'm going to take action for myself. So like a timer or some kind of thread. And it's going to poll other services and say, hey, I need a list of ships. Do you have any new ships? And the other service simply exposes an endpoint, which we can then get that data on. So a classic way we all used to do this was an atom feed. The ship registry would expose an atom feed of all the ships. Usually, it would be an event stream giving us all the changes to ships. Here's a new ship. The ship name was updated. The ship's cargo capacity was updated. The ship's line owner changed. We'd be able to use the data as it came down to construct effectively our local cache. Why an atom feed? Because atom feeds are highly cacheable because any page after the first page is immutable. If you go to that URI, you will always get the same response body back. Only the first page is allowed to be mutable. And you can check whether that's changed by looking at its last modified date. And that makes it very easy for you to poll, because you simply say, hey, give me the first page. Fine. Has this page changed since I last saw it by comparing dates? OK, it's changed. I need to start reading here and go back until the last thing that I saw. Maybe there have been several pages since you last read. So you read to the first page, and you get to the next page. Have I seen this page? Have I seen this page? Until the point where you get to the point where you say, I have seen everything now. Right? And that's usually quite quick. And that is basically how we used to do this kind of model, where you'd say, I want to consume your data. So, and you just need to poll whatever frequency you think change is likely to occur in the source system that will make you too inconsistent, right? You'll be, you become eventually consistent. The way you risk, I am now out of date, and I can't cope with being out of date for more than this window. Listing of ships, you know, it may not change much more than about once a day or once a week. I don't really know. <laughs> Nowadays, um, we'll talk about that a little, bit, a little bit more later, this kind of stuff tends to be done with things like Kafka, where essentially people create a log, a append-only log, and they shove out their events that they're publishing outside their system, which you can then trawl. Okay. So you can use Atom. It's really cheap and easy to get running. But the cool kids won't play with you because you haven't used Kafka. So, so you probably want to use Kafka so the cool kids play with you, right? OK. So event carriage state transfer. So Martin Fallon named this in 2017. We were all doing it beforehand, but like all things in life, you aren't really doing it until Martin Fowler names it for you, and then you can all breathe a sort of sigh of relief. It has a name now. We can talk about it with our friends without them doubting us. So he called it event carriage state transfer. And the idea is when a change happens that I think downstream consumers will be interested in, I publish an event. That event is really a document because it contains state, but I guess document carriage state transfer didn't sound so hot. So event carriage state transfer, basically they publish a document message out, and you listen downstream, and you simply take that and apply that to build a local cache. Make sense? So at Huddle, we've done this for a long time. Um, we effectively have a queue in between our systems, and the published events about things like, for example, new users, new documents, and downstream systems listen to those notifications and build their own local cache of the data. You want to be versioned, obviously, because we need to understand whether or not something we receive our message queue is a duplicate, et cetera, and we can discard and throw it away, or whether it's something that we want to retain or, and update our own local cache of the system. And we can get an idea of the disparity between the two 
by looking at basically the length of the queue in between, which tells us how out of sync we are, or actually just by comparing state in the two databases. But that means we no longer have to make the call to get ship data in this, in this instance. We can process using our local cache of data. Sometimes you're dealing with a source system where you're not writing the code, you don't have control over the code. So you can't publish events easily out for state changes. So what happens back here is typically we have a handler that's, that's basically been called by our command dispatch and result to some kind of front end event. Like Brighter will do this for you. And we put a message on the queue at the end of that handler as we commit to the database saying, hey, we've got to change. But if I can't get control of that and I want events, how do I do that? So the answer is you want to try and get the information out of the existing database and publish it as though it was an event. And there are a number of well-known techniques for this. One is to use triggers, but triggers in the database, and when something then changes on a row, you construct an event from that and publish it out from the database. <coughs> Another option is to poll your database and if you look for something that tells you there are changes, so a classic one we used at Huddle when we were com coming out of the monolith was an audit trail. When we saw an audit trail, we knew something had happened in the system and we were able to reconstruct what had happened effectively from that audit trail and publish a message downstream to consumers. That's a bit tricky because the SQL you have to write has to basically cope with a table that's getting a lot of writes because it's the audit trail but you want to read from and you don't want to block with your reads from the writes. So you have to get your deadlock victim status correct, so you kind of volunteer to give up all the time and just let the rights happen, and then you poll in the intervals in between. But it can get a bit awkward. The third one is something like log tailing. So essentially that means I listen to the transaction log on the database, I pick up on events and publish them out. So things like Kafka have connectors that let you plug into most common databases and pull out the events out of the system. So it's just kind of plug and play technology. And you can use Kafka then to push events. One, one question mark is how much data is it reasonable to surface from one service to another? Okay. Because obviously it's a, it would be a crazy world if I split that thing up into microservices and then said, Ian said we should cache data that we haven't got. So actually, everybody should really have a copy of all the data. It's just that they only know how, they can only edit one or two tables. And I didn't say that, I promise you. But so we go back and forth, I've been back and forth and had many debates on this. And the answer really is probably you are publishing data externally anyway. And that's a kind of data that probably you need to consider that you might want to then cache in other systems. But generally be driven by what the other systems need to, to do. Does that other system need to process using that data in a way that means you'd have to push control back to the other system to allow it to process it? My only big rule would be never share business knowledge between two services. And by that I mean when we publish data, say via a HTTP endpoint, you publish the data, but you don't publish rules with it. <coughs> So I have to be able to interpret that as the consumer data, I have to be able to interpret that data and use it in my own way. But I don't publish my rules about that data. Because sharing of the rules knowledge between services creates coupling between the services that if I change it in one service, I have to change it in all the other services. So if service one publishes a postcode, it's okay for service B to use that postcode in some way that it cares about. For example, checking that your credit card is correct. But it, the two systems shouldn't share a rule that says something like, we only allow customers from this postcode, and this other system decides to check that same rule. Right? Don't do that. The first system should have checked it for you. The second system should be agnostic to that. It only cares about payment information and matching up the credit card provider. So just don't share knowledge along with the data. Just share the data between the two systems. And be parsimonious. Right? Only cache the data if you genuinely need it. So the question that comes up at this point is, there are two ways obviously of publishing this data in terms of modern, the modern stack, right? So the first one is I use what we call a shared queue system. That's something like RabbitMQ or SQS. And what they are essentially is, it's a long table of all the messages that you publish for a given <coughs> topic. 
Something comes along and it says, I want to read a message, so it locks it and begins to try processing it. Another reader comes along and it says, I'm going to skip the locked one and I'll go to the next one. Okay, so they have to basically be able to, to lock an, an item and then skip an item to the next one. When you've processed it, you either knack it and say, leave it on the queue, I couldn't deal with it. Or you, more, more likely, you hack it. You acknowledge that you've dealt with that message, and it's deleted from the queue. So with a shared queue, what happens is messages keep getting deleted. I consume it, it's 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 deleted. That message doesn't exist anymore. So I can't go back and reread it. Now, I can publish it originally to many people, but I can't go back. Kafka is an append-only log. What we mean by that is you can't delete any of the data in Kafka. Well, you can delete the Kafka data, you can, but yeah, it's not fair. Um, but a, a normal message operation doesn't delete the data. It simply advances the index through the Kafka data. right? So you say, I've read message 5, I've read message 6, I've read message 7. So your consumer just indicates what it's seen, but I could reset the consumer's index to point to an earlier point in the queue and replay that sequence again. And that tends to change the way it works, whereas, whereas you have you know, multiple queues in, say, Rabbit topology, you kind of get one log partitioned in Kafka, and everyone's reading that same set of logs that have different indexes. So you kind of get a, almost a deduplication of the data, whereas in Rabbit, you've got a lot of consumers, you're duplicating the data everywhere across all those queues. And if what I'm doing is um, Sharing data, it's quite often better to use this log. And the reason is it lets you replay your ability to initialize a system with data with, and cache data from another system. So when we used the rabbit to, uh, approach to begin with, the problem we used to hit was in a non-production system, someone would spin up a new version of their service with a fresh database. But we already had existing systems in, the state, in that environment that the, the QA team wanted it to play nicely with. But it's got no cache data. So now it's going to struggle. So what we have to do is play data into it. Now what we do in most of our cases where we're using a shared queue is actually have an outbox and an inbox. So the outbox says messages I've sent, and the inbox says messages I've received. So you can replay the message from the outbox. But that floods everybody quite often with all the messages. Right? So it gets difficult to manage this kind of replay sequence of data that you want to cache. The advantage of a log is I'm at zero on the index. I'll just keep reading along until I get to the end, and then I'll basically populate my data. I'm all good. Thanks very much. You don't need to do anything, because your system is built to do that. It's built to say, oh, I'm supposed to read this log. Oh, I'm supposed to go until I, think, until the, the, until I haven't seen uh, 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 until something I've seen before. Hey, I haven't seen anything before. I'm in zero. I better read the whole log. Right? So, that's kind of a better model. Actually, you know, and all just in terms of all honesty, because of the period which we, we did it, we switched to this, but we used, we used event store to do it, um, yeah, which is a perfectly fine way of doing it. And I think from conversations with Greg, a lot of people actually use event store to do this, uh, rather than actually to do event sourcing. Um, but this is different to event sourcing, by the way. And we, we have to raise that caveat, because people basically get, get into this point, and they get quite religious about it. Event sourcing occurs inside the event horizon of your service. This is data that you are publishing outside. Don't publish your, in, your internal structures outside of the system, because then you can't change them. This is shared data that you want, effectively, to separate from your internal representation so that when you publish it, you can keep changing your internals if you need to and remain consistent on the wire for existing consumers. OK. How many we got? All right, we should, we should manage it. Correctness. <coughs> When I publish data from a source system like ship registry to a target system like the ship broker, this is, we're getting into the complex stuff, by the way, so don't worry too much if you're going, what is this? Okay. I need to make sure that the two of them end up consistent eventually. Now, imagine that I am writing a new ship record to my database and publishing that information over the queue at the same time. I probably can't use a distributed transaction between those two pieces of technology because A, that doesn't scale, and B, I'm probably using technologies that no longer support that particular approach. RabbitMQ is not going to enter a distributed transaction with SQL Server. 
So I have to have some way of avoiding the problem that when I publish onto the message queue, it's been written to the database. Or if I write to the data <coughs> <coughs> database is going to go on the queue. Okay. So how am I going to make sure that I'm not updating my data, but it's not published, or publishing, and it's not updated, and the two sides are, are, are correct? One option is basically called the outbox pattern. So in the outbox pattern, when I write to a table with the new state of my ship record, I also essentially write to a table an event that I want you to, to, to produce. Now, it may be that the outbox is something, a technology that your messaging framework provider provides for you. It may be that actually in your domain, you're thinking about that as um, domain events I need to raise outside, and you've got a list of them. You, could, you can use other technique. But the important thing is what you're saying is I'm going to write the two things at the same time, the message I want to send and the state change basically around that message. And then later, something effectively reads from that message table and sends the message over the wire. And it can keep retrying if it fails, but you are consistent. You can, you can eventually produce that message out and send it downstream. Okay. Often, we couple it with an inbox. And we do that because when we send the message on the broker downstream, that's not a transaction either. And it's going to a cluster, and there's no real way for the cluster, if it's not got a transaction, to know that it's copied to all the nodes. We can get some things that are called publish and confirm, which will basically say, well, when you give it to me, I'll confirm I got it. And then later, I'll tell you that all the nodes received it. And I can wait for that to come back, and I can say, I didn't get that, re that receipt within a good time window, so I must assume it didn't, all the nodes didn't get it. And it could be you read from one of the nodes that didn't get that piece of data, so I'm going to have to resend this. And that's called guaranteed at least once delivery. If I don't know that you received it, I will resend it. And it may be that you didn't get it. It may be that I didn't get your acknowledgement, but I have to be prepared to resend it. And in order to get guaranteed once only delivery, I need an inbox on the other side, which records what you've seen and discards duplicates. Kafka has a lot of this for you. Right? Kafka basically will do a lot of work to discard repeat messages for you. So that's another reason why it's quite helpful in the situation. Change data capture is another option. It says, I just write to the message log or, or, or shared key. And then a listener of that updates my database on both sides, essentially on the origin side and on the cache side. So now I know the only, the, the, effectively, unless the queue had it, nobody is going to write that state locally to that local change. And provided, essentially, I can keep sending messages over the queue to retry that, and you can deal with duplicates, everything will be good. And there are, very, there are some variations you see documented out there, but most of them essentially re relate to one of these two, or really variations on one of these two options, outbox or change state capture. But you need to ensure correctness of the downstream system when you're using this kind of approach, and the only real way you can do that to either use the outbox pattern or to use change data capture. Okay. Last stretch. That is most of what you need to know about creating events between two systems, right? So my system in the middle can now essentially work independently of the others because it has a cache of the data it needs from those other systems rather than asking them all the time for the data. And you, you could mentally get there if you just think, hey, I have to ask these systems for their data all the time. Maybe I just start caching that get request because I made it for 10 minutes. Then you start to get towards, why don't I just cache ahead of time by asking, right? By either asking the data by a polling mechanism, or, but asking is really bad, so I'm just going to listen for events. That's essentially all you're doing. Um, talk about a little bit about compositions and conversations. So one of the real advantages of my local cache of your data is that quite often it lets me compose data on the server. So when a request comes into my REST endpoint, Although normally, typically, I'd say, well, I've only know about the things that I'm the single writer for, the system of record for. So when I give you back some data, though there may be IDs for things like the user ID or whatever, I can't give you information like the username, et cetera, that would be helpful to the front end developer so that he can put the user's name on something rather than and their, and their address rather than having just to say user1236. Okay. 
And that solves some of the problems you get with REST APIs being typically seen as very chatty because you have to make subsequent calls back out in order to go and get that data. And you see a lot of criticism of REST, particularly from like, the graph community saying, oh, you know, you can't get basically uh, uh, you know, a graph structure in a REST. And one of the reasons you quite often don't is simply because you don't have the data. And if you cache the data, you can actually provide it back. Your copy is as good as their copy, right, from the point of view of giving it to other system. <coughs> if not, obviously, the other option generally on uh, that kind of system is to compose effectively in the client. And so the client does the job of eventually, essentially saying, I need to basically marry everything up together. So you've got holes in what you sent me. I've just got IDs and stuff. That's not going to be a great user experience. I'm going to have to ask the other systems basically for that information. And that's one of the things that, say, Graph does or REST basically needs to use a BFF for to do composition on the server rows post the client. Anyone know what BFFs are? OK, I mean, just simple, effectively, if I'm calling multiple services in order to basically build up something that's useful to the user from a user experience point of view, because this service came back IDs and I want to get names or actual addresses and values, I can do that in the client, or I can move the JavaScript to the server, run it on the server. If I do it on the server, it's probably lower latency, because it's closer to actually my, my systems. So I can reduce the latency, and the system's performance overall seems to improve. Okay. And the final thing that I don't really want to get into, because it's not the object of this topic, but the other thing to be aware of is when we talk about conversations, be that sagas, routing splits, process managers. A lot of the reason people reach for these technology solutions is because they can't get event-driven programming working correctly. Always be aware that a routing slip or a SARG or even a process manager is a request-driven architecture. Because it's saying, hey, I need you to do this. Hey, I need you to do this. And hey, I need you to do this. There is always, usually, an inverted model which says, hey, payment system, Take the payment from this customer. We're done. And you may say, what happens if there's no payment? Well, he raises an event saying, hey, payment declined for a customer. And I go, whoa, payment declined for a customer. I know how to deal with that. But there doesn't need to be a saga. right? If I assume that most cases succeed, I just basically send, raise an event saying, payment needed for this customer. And I assume someone downstream is going to make that payment. And I listen for events saying, payment declined, and then I deal with it. So unless there is, I am concerned about things like timing, uh, delivering the message, well, I've got an outbox and an inbox pattern. I've got change to capture. So I know the message is going to get there. I've got guaranteed once only delivery. Or am I concerned about uh, not having the data to process part of the request? Well, if I've cached the reference data locally, probably I may have the data and be able to process part of that request locally. And I don't need to do a round robin to everybody else to get the information I need to process the request. And a lot of people, because they know what a saga or a process manager or a routing slip is, say, I need one of those. And actually, in many cases, you could just do it with events, which means you remove centralized processing components out of your system and simplify and make things a lot easier. <coughs> okay. So try and think through an approach, first of all, that says, once I can isolate my systems from doing requests to each other and they can drive with events, then actually I can just use events to write for exceptional conditions and I can listen for those and take action. And generally, we think about four things. Ignore, retry, compensate, and coordinate. Ignore, right? Uh, something went wrong. It doesn't matter. Okay? There may be no business value in me trying to pursue that. It may cost me more than it's worth. Okay. Retry. I can retry the operation. Hey, you didn't get the payment. We'll just retry it. Maybe there's a temporary blip. Compensation. Manual or automatic. Manual means a human being wakes up and intervenes. They get an email and says, ooh, I better deal with that situation. And that's quite often the right response to some businesses. And some businesses love it. And the reason they love it is because they get contact time with the customer and they can offer excellent service. And quite often, automated business, they can't do that. Automatic compensation, which means some part of your system says, hello, the payment didn't get received. I better go and cancel stuff. <coughs> And coordination is the last one on the list, right? And that's when we start bringing in routing slips and process managers and start to say, I need to actually run a sequence of steps that will appear as a transaction. But that is not what you need to do most of the time. Okay. The um, example that's commonly given is Starbucks. Starbucks is a really efficient process. Okay. I go to the barista and I order my drink, and they basically put it in the queue and they write my name on the front. 
And Sobox has a really great compensation policy, which effectively is things like made a drink for a customer, and the customer goes, where's my drink? And it appears somebody else has walked off with it. Ignore. Certain percentage of those, I don't care. Oh, or you know, retry for this customer, right? I'll make his drink again, and I'll give him a new one, because it, it wasn't right. Compensation, which basically says, oh, you know, wasn't that awful here? Um, have a muffin, right? <laughs> so all these services basically work by those processes. So you can look to how businesses actually functioned in a, in a, in a non-automated way to quite often see people doing quite mature ways of dealing with these scenarios. But don't rush to uh, routing slips and sagas and process managers, because you're adding unnecessary complexity quite often. All right, I'm done. Thank you very much for sticking with it when the party is occurring. Um, like I say, I'm I Cooper on Twitter. I will be around at the party, so you can come and ask me questions about event-driven systems. I'm more than happy to answer anything you want to ask me. Um, I may say I don't know the answer, but I'm happy to let you ask me the question in the first place. Okay, great. Thanks very much.